Welcome to the latest research forum. Our topic today is corruption, and I have with me Professor Dan Huff. Dan, corruption is hardly a new topic, so why should we be interested in it particularly today? Well, you're right, corruption has been around for an awful long time, but as we've seen in, in recent years, there's been an awful lot of corruption scandals out there. To give you one example, the expenses scandal here in the UK um, was widely uh, seen as being uh, a, a key moment in recent British political history. Many MPs were uh, found to be making expenses claims that were viewed as corrupt, and there was huge uproar. There was lots of criticism of the political system, and uh, it, it made many MPs think long and hard about what uh, politics was all about. The idea of corruption may seem to be self-evident, but I expect it isn't when you're researching it. So how would you define corruption? Yeah, that's very true. Um, many of the international organisations that look at corruption take a pretty generic definition. They, they uh, would regard corruption as the, um, the abuse of a public role for private gain. Now that, that works to an extent, but the problem comes again, if I could use the expenses scandal, in that many things that we see uh, look corrupt, but in fact they don't really fit that definition. It's not, it wasn't actually illegal um, to renovate your moat or to build a nice little house for your duck on a pond. These things were perfectly okay with the expenses regime we had before 2008. So we soon find ourselves criticising things as corrupt because we don't like them. And yet they don't break the rules. They certainly didn't break the laws of the land. And in fact, only five MPs broke laws uh, in the expenses scandal. And they all did very silly things like claim uh, for mortgages they don't have. So the grey area is the, the difficult one, but it's the interesting one. The examples you've just given are from the UK, mm. but corruption is clearly an international phenomenon and your research pursues it internationally. So how do we compare political systems in their relationships to corruption? Well, it's very difficult and it's put off a lot of researchers in the past. There, there are um, a number of league tables out there that try and rank uh, corrupt practices. The problem with this is, of course, they can't measure corruption per se. I mean, wh what would you look for? You, you can't compare uh, the number of people who are in prisons for corruption because, of course, laws are different in different places. So what they tend to do is look at perceptions of corruption, and Transparency International have done that um, over the last 20 years, and they come up with a, a league table, 183 countries, and you see that certain countries do very well. Uh, the Scandinavian countries are always at the top of these league tables. They're always seen as being the least corrupt countries in the world, alongside uh, New Zealand. Uh, and at the bottom, you see um, countries that either um, ha are failed states or countries where uh, authoritarian control is very strong. So joint bottom in the last CPI were North Korea and Somalia, where there is effectively no government. So you, we can compare and contrast corruption across different national boundaries, but it's not easy, and it's certainly not an exact science. You've defined the subject. You've talked about the relationship to wider political systems. We also, I imagine, want to talk about how to combat corruption? Yeah, well, again, this is difficult. You have to understand a little bit about how a country works before you can actually pinpoint what one needs to do about corruption. In some places, the best way of tackling corruption is simply by not talking about it. Um, if you're seen to challenge vested interests, if you're seen to point the finger at politicians in countries where corruption is systemic, they're not going to listen. It's like asking Turkeys to vote for Christmas. The key thing there is to look like you're not tackling corruption by going about it in different ways, beefing up uh, uh, the media, allowing people just a little bit more access to information about their lives. A good example uh, comes in China, where internet freedom, big issue at the moment, the censors in China do try and clamp down on, uh, on, on, on behaviour they don't like, but they can't. There are too many people online asking too many questions. Supporting that framework is a really good way of tackling corruption, even if you might not look like that's what you're trying to do. You just published a book on corruption and anti-corruption mm. and what to do about it. And you have case studies from all over the world. Mm. What's the main lesson you draw from your research so far? Well, there's two things I'd say. First of all, you have to look at individual circumstances. There is no one size fits all remedy, unfortunately. Uh, every case is different. Also, in some cases, as I say, don't talk about corruption, but in others, you've got to stress two things. You've got to stress transparency, you've got to give people information, and you've got to make people accountable for their actions. If you do that, then slowly but surely, it's a winding path, but you're likely to, to make some inroads into tackling corruption. Fascinating subject. Thanks, Dan.